everyone. This is Paula Harris, and I have Dr. James Sanderson with me this morning from Birmingham, Alabama. Are you in Birmingham? I am in Birmingham. Good morning, Paula, and good morning, everyone. <laughs> Sometimes you're around the country, so I just want to make sure we're uh, getting you in the right location. So <laughs> Dr. Sanderson and I have known each other for many years, probably, what, 15 more than that? Probably more than that. Probably more than that, yes. And um, you have an amazing story, and I've enjoyed coaching you and your team all those years. And you, you and your family are really kind of my friends. I consider you to be friends. And um, you know, I wanted I wanted you to share because I think you have a lot of things to share that will be an inspiration to other doctors. So that's why I invited you to do this today. Um, because you're in your second career, or is this your third or fourth career? <laughs> yeah, you could probably say third career, I guess, maybe fourth, something like that, at least third. Okay, so you have, you have transitioned well, and I think that's uh, something that a lot of doctors are wondering about. What's, what's going to happen when I sell my practice, or what's going to happen when I'm not in dentistry anymore, or I'm not doing what I'm doing today? So um, I wanted you to just share a little bit of your story of how you got into dentistry and, and, and then just what's happened in the last two or three years. Well, um, I started out with a plan to uh, become an, an athletic trainer. Uh, and so I started out as a student athletic trainer at the University of Alabama in 1974. And we had a great run there from 74 to 78 and um, had some great teams there. And during that time, uh, had an opportunity to uh, meet the chancellor of the university. And we had two different conversations. One where he was talking about <clears throat> bringing things to the University of Alabama in Birmingham, like a football team and basketball team and some other stuff and sports medicine which wasn't really, it, it, it didn't exist at the time. Mm -hmm. And, um, and was giving me, was going to give me a significant opportunity to participate in that. And, um, I told him that I'd really like to go back to Alabama one more year. Cause I thought we were going to win a national championship. And so I did. And that spring, a guy walked in our training room named, uh, Mitch Ferguson, and said, hey, I'm the new trainer at UAB. And I'm like, well, you son of a gun. You stole my job. Oh. Uh, he and I are friends to this day. And uh, it was many years later before I told him that story. But uh, he, he and I have maintained a, good, a, great, a great relationship. He, he's done a fantastic do job at UAB. And he has, uh, Drew Ferguson has done just, uh, he's, he's done a tremendous job with that whole system there. Um, for me, I met back with Dr. Volker a, time, a, little, a little bit later. And first thing out of his mouth was, you know, you don't need to, you know, you know don't close any doors. And I, you know, I know a student athletic trainer at a university meeting with the chancellor is probably not supposed to say something like this, but it sort of came out. And I said, well, I don't think I'm the one that closed the door. And he smiled and looked at me and said, well, no, I, I'm, I'm talking about medicine or dentistry. And he, he, the, he said uh, the thing that he missed about doing dentistry was that if his mind could see it, his hands could make it. And I immediately knew that I knew how to do that. I didn't know how I knew how to do that, but I knew exactly what he was talking about. And so uh, that turned my career in another direction. My father uh, at the time was a dentist and I knew a, a little bit about dentistry. I didn't think I wanted to practice dentistry, uh, but uh, I, I suddenly knew that was really where I needed to go. Or that's, and so, um, Fast forward, and here we are. Yes, and you had you had a wonderful practice. You had a private practice, you know, which is um, important to distinguish these days with all of the 
the groups that are that are going on. And you also had a fee for service practice. Tell us a little bit about what that is. Some people don't even know what that term is. You know, that, that's sort of the way that it just started out. Uh, that meant that I developed a relationship with a patient. I got to know that patient. I figured out what was wrong in that patient's mouth. I figured out what that patient wanted to do about that, uh, given the options that they had. Mm-hmm. We presented that treatment uh, and all of that. Can We could talk about last 30 seconds of what I said for probably four or five or six hours. Yes, we could. But, um, you know, and, but the whole deal was getting to the heart of the matter, Mm -hmm. whatever you had to do to get to the heart of the matter. That's bottom line. Once I've got to the heart of the matter, then, okay, now I know what to talk about as far as how we're going to work on fixing this. And then lay out a plan. Everybody agrees to the plan. Money exchanges hands and you get going on the plan and you turn around one day and you may have waxed models. You may have lasers. You may have microscopes. You may have all kind of stuff, but all of a sudden a little patient looks up at you and they just, they start crying because you have had the opportunity to, um, change their life Mm. yes that's where it's at right there and um you were so good at building relationship with patients you still are i mean you're still in the field so um that was one thing that it you know it really takes that if you're going to be a practice not dependent on insurance contracts you have to have a different level of patient experience and you were pro at that you absolutely were. Plus, you were, you were advanced. I think you were ahead of your time on a lot of the technology used. And you you got there first. Is that right? So in 1992, I got my first uh, uh, digital X-ray machine, and I told the rep, I said, "Look, you know, if I can't make this work in two months, you're getting this thing back." <laughs> uh. And I, I, he didn't really know how to take that, but I meant it. But I also meant I was going to do everything in my power to have that implemented across the board in my practice. Mm. And so we had periapicals and bite wings right then, boom. And two months later, he comes in sort of sheepishly, like, you're really not going to give this back to me, are you? <laughs> <laughs> I said, no, you can't have it. <laughs> you know, and... <clears throat> uh, right along that same time, I threw away my 35 millimeter camera. I didn't really throw it away. It's still here. Uh, but I went to an SLR camera and, uh, you know, every patient got the American Academy of, of uh, Aesthetic Dentistry implant series on that patient so that I could have a better chance to communicate with them with a PowerPoint presentation or however you, we used it. We used it serve a a package called image fx Mm -hmm. but uh whatever we could do to communicate and let the patients see on the computer what i'm looking at that's right and uh and you you're one of the ones that that really um it stands out to me that you did the before during and after pictures of all your treatment you know before you started after you prepped and I mean, during the prep and then after the restoration was finished. I tried to do all of them. I did ones that I knew would be significant cases. Mm-hmm. Uh, we did a lot of that. And so that meant that I had to figure out a way um, for a long time, like 10 plus years. I thought James was the only one in the practice that could take a photograph and have it turn out right. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I really did. <clears throat> and yeah. then that just became impossible. And I, plus I liked doing the photography. Yeah. But um, then things changed and I had a great, a fantastic lady who stayed with me a long time. And we could talk about how you, some things that I think had an impact on that too, if you want. But, 
uh, they did, and they all took responsibility for different roles in the practice. And uh, the last 15 years of my practice, I didn't take any photographs at all. Wow. And uh, I used those photographs to present with. I used those photographs to present to patients with. I mean, we did all of it. We had a, we developed a system where we put a, a video camera on my light, and then my world changed when I got a microscope. Yeah. And once you get a microscope, then a whole lot of things change. And uh, one, your back stops hurting. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, and I think I became a better dentist. Mm -hmm. But uh, you can document what you're talking about, and you can communicate much easier with the patient in real time. Uh, about what's going on in their mouth and they can see it and then you can sit up and both of them talk about it. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and you were um, chartless or paperless way before that was the wave. You know, I, I, I was, but part of my personal problem was that my new patient exam and my communication to the patient, I always did a, a typed up narrative. Mm -hmm. that uh, I did that didn't have anything to do about MODs or whatever. It just talked about <clears throat> uh, this is, these are the problems the patient presents that the patient tells me about. These are their, these are the patient's words of what they think is wrong, what they were, what they want. That's so important. What <clears throat> is said. Yeah. Yeah. And then right besides that on the top third of the page, I would write down some broad general findings that I would have. You know, you got periodontal disease or you got decay or you got whatever. Or Conditions. You, you know, your teeth don't match together or whatever. Then the middle third of the page, I would sit down and I would say, okay, what's going to happen if we don't do anything about this? And uh, that was pretty much the same on most all of them because it was true. And yeah. Anything is going to get worse, and it's going to cost more. And there may be some other stuff added to that. But then, at the bottom third of the page, I would write a narrative of, okay, how is at least one way to fix this? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and if there were multiples, then I would, you know, use use that. And so I had a piece of paper that I would sit on the consult table when the patient came back in, and I had my slideshow going. So the patient could see the photographs of their mouth. And if I had models or wax up done, I'd have that sitting in there so that, you know, and it was sitting there, not like a dentist would use it, but so that the patient could pick it up and feel like they wouldn't break it. Yeah. And so they could, they could look at it and see what, okay, this guy's, I don't know what he did, but he must have spent a bunch of time getting this thing ready for this. And yes, the answer to that question was yes. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> and uh, we'd sit down and again, getting all that stuff's important, but getting to the heart of the matter mm -hmm. was the deal. Yes. Yes. And you had a, you had a great rapport with your patient's faith. They felt like they could open up to you, tell their concerns, their stories, and your team as well. I mean, you were really zoned in on building relationships, and it showed. And, and the team, having a team around me that could uh, pick up where, I mean, the reality is my strength, you know, we've talked about driver, interactive socializer. Yeah. It, you know, DISC and all yeah. that kind of stuff and cautious person, <laughs> you know, I generally, when I was in the office, I was the driver and I really didn't, there was a lot of stuff that needed on that stuff on the personal side that needed to happen. But I was all pers realistically, I was already thinking about something else. But Susan wasn't. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> or Kelly wasn't. I'm right. And so I had somebody that I knew would hold me back. <laughs> yeah. And say, come on, I know you want to go over here. We'll come right over right here right now. And so that made a bunch of that, that made a big difference. Yeah. 
They did. They kept you on track. They, you know, you, you had a great vision for the practice and they bought into that vision. And even when maybe you weren't always right on target, they kept you on target. Um, they kept me on target. That, that's a great team right there. That's a great team. So you must have learned that from Bear Bryant. <laughs> Coach Bryant had a huge impact on me. I would still like to have a conversation with him on a regular basis. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So, and you did get that ring, didn't you? I did get the ring. Yes, that's right. I remember you wrote, you wrote something about that. So, well, tell us what you're doing now. How did you get to where you are now? Okay, so about seven years before I quit practicing, I developed, uh, my hands started moving on me. Mm. And like a whole lot of people, I didn't want anybody to know. Yeah. I didn't want to admit it. Mm. Uh, I thought I was real good at covering up. Mm. And I did cover it up to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. uh, I finally went to go see my physician and I told him about it. And he said, well, you need to go to a neurologist. I'm like, great. That's just what I need. <clears throat> I don't need to go to a neurologist. I just need you to help me quit this. Yeah. And so I go see the neurologist and he walks in the room and I'm sort of flippant with him. Not really, but I'm like, I said, uh, I said, I literally told him, Hey, look, I'm looking for a magic bullet. I want this stuff to quit. And he tested me and he said, okay, well you have what's called an essential tremor. And he described it to me and, and asked me <clears throat> certain things. You get bored better or worse here and all that. And I said, yeah. And so he said, I think I do have a magic bullet. I said, okay. And he gave me a drug called primidone. Mm -hmm. 25 milligrams in the morning, another 25 in the afternoon, if I felt like I needed it. And so I was at 50 milligrams of primidone a day. And it's like you turn the clock back. Mm. And I was good to go. Yeah. And so I quit worrying about that. And then um, I hit a wall and it got significantly worse. And so I go back and the first neurologist is no longer work, working and the second neurologist walks in. And he says, well, I'm one of three in the world that are experts on this. And I'm like, well, sit, your, sit down. I want to see you. Yeah. <clears throat> and um, I went back and I, and I told him, I said, look, if you tell me to, I, you know, I won't go back to the office, but I need to know whatever. And he said, well, if you want it, I'll give you a, a letter today saying you're disabled. And, I'm, and I was like, no. Oh, I'm, I'm a kid in a candy store. I'm having a blast. Mm. I love it. And uh, I don't want to quit. Yeah. And he said, well, uh, I said, but it, he said, you'll know when. And, and I left there on 250 milligrams uh, three times a day. Ooh. And uh, that's a pretty significant amount. And he also told me, he said, by the way, I don't, you don't, I don't know if you knew this or you checked this or not, but if you do a urine sample for somebody, you're going to fail the test. So you need to call me before you go to do that urine sample. You're, you're safe to work. Yeah. You know? And I, I, I was like, huh? And so, and I, and I, and I, I, and I remember thinking back, well, you fool, you didn't even go look up the drug you were on. <laughs> you've been on this drug for seven years mm. and so uh i happen to have a great relationship with my attorney he's also a friend mm. i was upset and sometimes that's when you call friends and uh, he got real concerned and, and he said Okay. Now he told you, you could work. I said, yeah, I told him I wouldn't go back to work if he told me I couldn't. He said, and he told me I was safe. And he said, so <clears throat> let me get this right, James. Let's see if I've got this. 
you've been in front of two neurologists, you've been told that you're disabled. If you were to have a bad outcome, uh, you're indefensible. Mm. Yeah. Mm. So uh, we're selling your practice. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. that started me down a path where I was really mad. Um, I mean, really mad mm -hmm. uh, at God. Mm. And I just, um, I stayed there for a while. Yeah. <clears throat> um, I remember... Um, the, the Sunday afternoon that I, um, decided to sell the practice or, or made the, made the, the decision to, to go forward. I met somebody in there that was going to be the broker and she was taking pictures and I gave her some money and patient called right about that time. Hey, look, I'm hurting. Come on in. I'm here. And uh, I was able to um, check what was going on and um, found the problem. When I fixed the problem, the patient, even though the patient was numb, the patient looked up at me and says, what did you do? I said, I, I, it, it doesn't matter. It's fixed. <clears throat> Let's go. He gets to the front door. He's reaching in his back pocket to give me some money. And I'm like, bye, get out of here. And um, I locked the door and I turned around and I just started cussing. Mm. Because I was like, don't you get it? I'm good at this stuff. Yeah. Why are you going to take this away? <clears throat> and um, I stayed mad mm. uh, for a while. And um, through a series of months, I kind of sort of had little episodes like that <clears throat> and trying to be nice, trying to do what I was supposed to do. You can't talk to your team because you're, you know, the, things will fall apart on you and da, 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 all those, you're given all kinds of advice about what to do and what not to do, which is contrary. Most of it's contrary to what the way I live my life. I mean, I'm basically, I've got a group of ladies that I told everything in the world about my life and I ain't telling them the truth. Yeah. <clears throat> and I mean, I got, I got several things going on around me that I'm just like, this is not fun. Yeah. And um, whether this is real or my imagination, I got it from the chair one day and I, I uh, I had done something and I looked up and I was like, well, did you see that one? And when I looked up, it was like God was sitting on his throne and he just started laughing at me. Hmm. <clears throat> and he started laughing so hard, he fell off of his chair, rolled around on the floor laughing, and looked up at me at the end of his laughing and, and just smiled, this I love you smile, and said, uh, James, I happen to know how good you are. You going to do what I'm asking or not? Mm. And that... Uh, that was a different day. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so, um, probably not long after that, mm -hmm. oh, a few weeks after that, we were in the process. Like I said, we were close. We were about a month from selling the practice. And <clears throat> I was doing a surgery on a young girl and, uh, I, uh, got finished with the surgery. Everything was fine. It's in the front of the mouth. And, um, 
I couldn't, I, I couldn't grab the suture. Mm. My hand was just moving such that I, I couldn't grab the suture. And for the first time in my life, I uh, looked up at Kelly and I didn't say anything. I set the instrument down. I got up and we went to go get some water and I'm coming back thinking, okay, I can, I can swap chairs with Kelly and tell her to do it. She's seen me do it enough. She ought to be able to tie this suture. I can talk her through it anyway. Uh, that's, 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 that's not an issue. Well, actually it's a real problem. I, I can't ask her to do that. Um, but I might, <laughs> this is just what's going through my mind. Yeah. And it was like, okay, well I can get, uh, I've got an old surgery front friend of mine that's across the street. He'll, he'll come over and fix this. It's four o'clock. He's about done anyway. Hopefully he's still there. You know, so I sat down and I said, okay, if I can do this, I'll do it. If I want, if I can't, you know, then I'll go to plan B. And luckily I was able to tie the sutures, get a good knot. And I got out of there and everybody went home. I didn't say a word to Kelly. Uh, I just acted like it was just another day in the dollar day in the neighborhood. And I got in my car on the way home and it's like, I, I'm done. I, I don't, I no longer deserve to go back in somewhere where I don't know for a fact that I'll be able to finish it if I've started. Uh, you've had a good run. Everything's set up. You're ready to go. Don't. Just stop. And... Uh, my, I had, uh, my lab technician had called me on Monday prior to that. <clears throat> and he said, Hey, look, my son's in this other practice. And if you have a problem, uh, he was somebody that I talked to. He said, if you have a problem and you need some coverage, we'll, you know, they, if they're practicing things, they can handle it. And I told him on that Monday, I said, nah, I'm fine. I'm, I, I got this. We're, we're good to go. We'll get to closing. We'll make the transition. And uh, over the weekend, I called him and I said, look, I, I, I got a problem. And so Monday morning, I walked back in with uh, his son and uh, my team came apart. Mm. It was uh, not good. They sat down and said, what in the world are you talking about? <clears throat> this is not how you do transitions. I've been, you know, so-and-so has been a part of transitions and you, what you do is you bring the new guy in and you did, 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 did over time. And, you know, and, and what are you talking about? You're through practice. Industry. What are you talking about? You've got a problem with your hands that you got, you, you didn't tell us. You didn't, I mean, just really great things. And, you know, you've been lying to us this whole time. Is everything you're talking about that you, is this who James Sanderson, mm -hmm. You know, who is James Sanderson? Are you what? And and I'm sitting there and I'm watching my team disintegrate. Yeah. Uh, oh my word. Mm. When somebody believes you a hundred percent and then you don't be truthful to them. <clears throat> and they don't understand why you've done what you've done, whether it's the right reason or the wrong reason, that's a problem. That's a big problem. Uh, thankfully, I had a, a, uh, an old-time friend. I don't know about, I should say old-time friend, but, but a, a true friend by the name of Paul Harris. And I went to my office, I called, I said, hey, it's blown up. <laughs> Yeah, I remember that day. <clears throat> Let's get up. I don't know what I'm going to do now. <laughs> and um, we had a lot of crying going on, a lot of this and going that going on, but um, we were able to work through it. And we worked through the transition. And um, uh, thankfully, um, 
that worked out. It did not work out as smoothly as I anticipated or as I wanted it to, but it, uh, you know, uh, at yeah. least I wasn't laying dead in a hospital somewhere. You know, right. there, <clears throat> there's other dentists that have, the wife had to walk in on Monday morning. I mean, there's been, well, there's been much worse scenarios than what mine was. Uh, but, uh, the relationships it still it doesn't matter you, you you build relationships and you trust and when that changes mm -hmm. uh, it can be very hurtful yeah but you know i appreciate you sharing that because um Number one, you're being vulnerable, and there's been a little distance between it now, but I'm sure it's still painful. Um, it was very painful for me. It was, I was close to your team, and you know, the cool thing about it is you did well with it. You really did. I mean, you could have fallen apart. You could have done a lot of things, gone on medication to uh, relieve your mental anxiety. Um, become an alcoholic you know you could have run away i mean there's so many choices you could have had but you stuck it out and um you did transition and you know the lord had a plan for you you're you're so gifted and talented there were a lot of options on the table and look at where you've landed with fire horizon so can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing your title is clinical advisor but what does that mean so <clears throat> Uh, to back up a little bit, you know, we got through and we got home and, um, <clears throat> and I, I had some friends that I'd been playing golf with a lot. And so I started playing golf more with them. And, um, and I just, you know, it's sort of like, what are you going to do? And I was like, well, I don't want to do anything right now. Uh, and, and, and what is the next part of your life? What am, what am I going to do? I'm 62 years old. What am I going to do? You know, am I going to just sort of go to the golf course and hang out with a bunch of guys and hit golf balls? Uh, you know, what am, what am I going to do? And, and I didn't know what I was going to do. Um, I, my life had been wrapped up in Dr. Sanderson and fixing problems every day fixed and come home, do what I needed to do. We had a great family and great kids, all that kind of stuff and get up in the morning and go, fix other stuff. I mean, and that's, that's who I was. And, um, so that was gone. And, and I was like, okay, God, what, okay, you want me to quit this stuff? What do you want? I'm, you know, you know, you can audibly talk to me if you want to. I'm listening. <laughs> and I didn't hear anything. And I'm like, okay, well, tell me, tell me what you want me to do. And different opportunities came up. And um, as each one of those opportunities sort of showed up, I, you know, something happened to get in the way. And so my wife was going, hey, James, I've never seen you sit around. What are you doing? I was like, well, I'm waiting right now. And that was about a year. So hard. And... Um, Steve Bogan and Bio Horizons uh, has been a friend for a long time. Our kids grew up together, and he one night at dinner, he's like, "So, tell me what you're doing. What you you know you, you hit enough golf balls? Not really." <laughs> and uh, so I've been thinking about you. Come see me. And I sat down in his office, and we were talking about different things. He said, "So, how would you like to become a mentor?" And I'm like, "Huh?" I said, well, Steve, that's, that was a goal I wrote down several years ago. Mm. Would you mind keeping talking about this? 
And so uh, BioHorizons hired a clinical advisor. We are one of the, uh, depending on who you ask, what specific number, but we're one of the top four implant companies in the world mm -hmm. and, uh, and growing. It's a tremendous company with a tremendous culture across the board. Mm. It's one of the things that I told Steve er, fairly early on, within a couple of months of being there, I was like, hey, you know, I understand what it takes to create a positive culture and understand what it takes to keep it and understand how easy it is to lose it. Yeah. And um, you got one and you got 500 people across the world. Yeah. This is impressive to me. And so today, what I do for BioHorizons is, is we do courses around uh, throughout our different territories. Um, sometimes I'm asked to go and participate in those courses and do hands-on kinds of things and develop, here we go again, and develop relationships with doctors that yeah. are yeah. customers. <clears throat> and if they want it, then we develop further relationship and I help them plan some cases. I maybe go to their office and do an over the shoulder kind of thing. I can't do anything in the mouth, but I can say, hey, no, go there. Or we, you know, I, I, I can be directive around some of that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so that's been, uh, it, it takes a little while. Doctors are not really, uh, immediately trustworthy sometimes but uh when they figure out that you know hey I, I don't think james is making any money whether i buy anything or not yeah uh maybe he is just here to help <laughs> so, yeah there you go yeah <clears throat> like, yeah you're right here we go building trust and so uh that's what i get to do uh, now is go around, get to know people, uh, get to hear their stories. And, you know, some people are in corporate environments that they absolutely love and they are rock stars in those corporate environments. Uh, some people are in private practice kind of situations that they hate. Vice versa. I mean, it's just, uh, you know, dentistry is a complex thing. Dentists are complex people, as you have come to know over your career as somebody who's tried to help us get from point A to point B, Paula. And, and, and without people like you, uh, I'm, I, I shudder to think about where our profession would be. I mm -hmm. really do. Uh, Thank you. You know, you're, you know, you're not necessarily the headline speaker at the ADA convention this year. If, if I were in charge, I would make that change. Well, personally. Thank you. <laughs> but, but, uh, I like this. I like the one-on-one. -on -one. Right. Right. That's, that's not your goal. If it were your goal to go do that, I'm quite confident that's what you'd be doing. But, but you want to be doing, you want this. And I understand. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Well, um, you know, it's, it's just an encouraging story. And, uh, you know, I just want to thank you for sharing with everybody um, the pain that you went through because it was devastating for a lot of people, including yourself, especially you and your patients and your team. But, but you know what? God had a plan all along. And he's using you in a wonderful way as a clinical advisor. And it's kind of expanding your, your territory of, of helping other people in a larger way than what you were doing in your practice. Yeah. I mean, there are people that, that I'll never see that if these guys and ladies implement what we're talking about, uh, that will be helped. That's exactly right. That's, so, that's a big deal. It is a huge deal. It's a huge deal. That's the um, pinnacle of leadership, really, when you're helping others help others. So, um, you know, leaders don't just create followers, they create other leaders. And that is what you've been doing. So, um, as we wrap up here, 
are you available if a doctor wants to talk to you? Um, maybe they're struggling with something like this or um, they just wanted to talk about biohorizons or how, how would they get in contact with you? So uh, just J Sanderson, S A N D E R S O N. Okay. At biohorizons, B I O H O R I Z O N S. Okay. All right. And my cell is 205-936-0336. Gotcha. Okay. Well, again, thank you so much. And um, maybe we can do this again and talk about some okay. other things. You have a lot to share. <laughs> There's a lot in the pile. You are, there is. I mean, you've done some amazing things. You've had some, some crazy things happen to you, but it's always made something good and with God's help. So, um, again, thank you for sharing, and I'm looking forward to um, sharing this with a lot of doctors, and they get to hear, and, and you can take it and share with whomever you like, and um, we'll, we'll talk with you again sometime soon, okay? Right. Thank you, Paula. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.